Did evolution help crows and ravens take over the world? Hi, welcome to Answers News for May the 9th, 2022. I'm Dr. Jordan Purdom. This is Dr. Gabriella Haynes and Tim Chafee. And before we get to our lead article, learning about crows and ravens, we are going to have a little bit of interesting news. We like to always start it off with that. And uh, I think it's pronounced go back. Tepe. That's pretty good, yeah. Oh, see, I did pretty good on that. Yeah. All right, maybe made by aliens, says mayor. All right, so why don't you talk about the archaeological significance of this particular place? Yeah, so Gobekli Tepe is uh, often viewed as one of the very first cities that have been found, one of the earliest cities. Of course, in our view, that would be one of the first cities post-flood, of course, post-Babel as well, right. we would view that. Um, but uh, So it's an interesting find for that reason. There's um, uh, some unique ways in which it was built, uh, but uh, in this article, <laughs> <laughs> I, it reminded me, if you've ever watched um, Ancient Aliens on there, yeah. and you got the Giorgio, the guy with the hair and everything, it just, that's what I, I felt like he was <laughs> writing Trying this. To that do that. The reason why there's some strange structures there, it must be aliens. Uh -huh. yeah. They must yeah. have built it. Yeah. yeah. So how do, how does he know how alien? works and, and do stuff. Uh, it's uh, a lot of times what happens with these ancient alien folks is you find these ancient structures and they're they're they marvel at what people were able to do. You right, know, Stonehenge right, okay. or the Great Pyramid or some of these things that, that there are some megalithic structures, things that people made in the past that today we look at and think, wow, how could they do that? And that's yeah. And that comes from evolutionary assumptions yes. too, that they think ancient man wasn't smart, right. you know, couldn't do these things. So so how could they possibly have done this? And so then they just say, Oh, well obviously aliens did right. Mm -hmm. And from our view, well, no, humans have been intelligent from the very beginning because God created mm -hmm. Adam and right. he was able to speak the first day that he was around. And in fact, we think Adam was probably far more intelligent than us. I mean, oh, the yeah. guy lived 930 years and he didn't have as many flaws as we did. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Right. I think the mayor of the town who declared <laughs> this, I have a feeling he just wants people to visit his town. Yeah, okay. I, I would say so. <laughs> I think there's an ulterior motive to yes. claiming it's yes. aliens. All right. How evolution helped crows and ravens take over the world. Right, so that is a problematic title because evolution is not what is described in the article itself. It's more likely to say how speciation or variation within the kind that crows and ravens belong to helped them take over the world. And that's um, not evolution. Right, that's not evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very different thing. So evolution is a change of one kind of organism into a different kind of organism. What we're talking about here is just speciation, right? So it's just like rays, uh, ravens and crows all belong to the same kind. And so while there might be variation within that kind, they're staying crows and ravens, right? They're not becoming a different type of bird. They're not becoming a non-bird. Mm -hmm. They're staying birds. Yeah, and that's interesting from the title, how evolution helped Evolution, it's a concept. It's not an entity. It's not a person. It can't help anyone. <laughs> you know, it can't, it can't even help itself. So, um, so that's the big problem, even the title. Logical mm -hmm. fallacy, it's one of the things that once you learn, you just get, it's going to be very easy to, to see those problems, the logical problems here. And this really kind of reminded me of what Darwin was noticing with the finches on the Galapagos and everything, where you're seeing variation mm -hmm. in beak sizes and other things, and, and because they, they seem to be adapted well for the island and the type of the food that they have on those islands. Well, it's not because they evolved those things, it's because there was an original population that had certain traits, and those that were best suited for those are the ones that continue to thrive, whereas mm -hmm. the other ones, they, they didn't survive as well. So you're, it's, what you're looking at is a loss of information in each of these times. You're not gaining new information. Right. It's still uh, those finches are still, guess what? Finches. Mm -hmm. They didn't become something else. Right. And in Lions. these cases, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you're, just, you're just getting variation with it. I mean, there's genetic diversity that God created animals with. And so, um, and so depending on the environment that they're in, certain traits will be favored for, yeah. certain traits will be so favored against, so to speak. That doesn't sound right, but anyway, selected <laughs> for. <laughs> selection is really the term there. Selected for or selected against. And so you can get these variations because at one point they say they acquired new beak shapes. No, they didn't acquire them. Okay, mm -hmm. they were already there. They just became dominant through um, these different mechanisms that that are in place. And so you get speciation, you get variation within the kind, but you don't get. Uh, you definitely don't get evolution. Right. Yeah. 
And the, the classic, these are the types of things they point to in textbooks. They'll point to variation within a kind, which is observable, and we can see that. We agree with that. Right. But then they ca say, look at the little changes. Over a long period of time, it adds up to big changes, different kinds of animals. And no, it doesn't, because <laughs> th there's limits set by the DNA. Right. And so after, you know, uh, Raven was one of the birds that Noah sent out from the ark. And so after the flood, these birds would have went out and from the ark and they're going to speciate they're going to there's going to be variations again that are selected for or against depending on the environments that they're in um, god apparently created these this kind with a lot of genetic diversity so they could adapt to a mm -hmm. wide variety of different environments which you would have seen mm -hmm. in a post-flood world so. and it might be one of the reasons why god sent seven or seven pairs of the flying creatures mm -hmm. is to help reestablish those environments because they're going to be able to get to different places and distant places a lot quicker than other animals and than people people right. and so they could help prepare those environments for everything else. Yep. Yeah. Okay, moving on to dingoes now. Dingoes are part domestic dog, part wolf, sort of. <laughs> There's a really scientific title for you. <laughs> so basically they've done some genetic testing of dingoes and they found out that they're somewhere between a wolf and a modern domestic dog. Now here's the thing you need to understand is that wolves and modern domestic dogs are both the same genus and the same species. They're all Canis lupus, right? So they're not, so dingoes then, even though they're considered a different species, um, they actually, what they're saying in this article is they sort of come from um, these wolves and domestic dogs somehow. Um, but again, this isn't evolution. This is definitely just variation or speciation within the dog kind that God created. Yeah, in the paper, uh, in this article, it says, but their evolutionary history, and then here you see again a worldview being played. They believe that this is real, that they're calling history. And one thing that, uh, as Dr. Georgia was saying, is the scientists suggest that humans brought the ancestors to, of modern dingoes to Australia. Are they talking, and there was between 5,000 and 8,500 years well, ago? Yeah. Are they talking about Ken Ham here? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The time frame is wrong. Right, I mean, it yeah. been he's, he's almost that old, but not <laughs> yeah. quite. <laughs> yeah, it would have been 4,500 years ago yeah. or less. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been any more than that because of the flood. Yeah. Right. We don't have a problem with the idea that m men, m humans, brought dogs to Anybody. Australia. That's not a, that's mm -hmm. not the issue here. Mm -hmm. The timeline Just we would take of, issue yeah. at. Uh, one thing that they talk about in here, uh, the importance of trying to preserve this the species, this um, the dingo, and uh, you know I I want them to do that as well. I think dingoes are cool. I think the the puppies are super cute if you've ever seen pictures of them. But um, one thing from a biblical perspective, what we really should be thinking more about is like the preservation of the kind rather than of the species, because uh, in, in in most cases, obviously, there are times where you have one that is of a species within that kind that is that is crucial to keeping mm -hmm. it around. But sometimes we uh, people will will chase around after every little tiny variation and think it's so important to protect that thing when you already have 99 other members of that kind right there, and mm -hmm. so it's ultimately not that big of a deal. Uh, but so, if we're thinking from a biblical perspective, it's more about the kind than the species. Yeah, yeah. That's and correct. they talk about how these dogs like. So um, wolves and dingoes only have one copy of a certain gene, but domestic dogs actually have more copies of that gene. But again, that's no new information. If you're going to go from one kind of organism to another, like a bird into, or a dinosaur into a bird, you're going to have to get a lot of new genetic information. But this is just either more or less of the same mm -hmm. genetic information. So again, that just gives you variation within um, the dog kind versus a different, different kind or evolution. All right, what color were the dinosaurs? Now, this article is interesting <laughs> because like a lot of articles nowadays on dinosaurs, they want to link them to birds, right? They want to say that birds are modern day dinosaurs. And so all throughout this article over and over again in trying to describe what color were the dinosaurs, they're really gonna focus on their supposed feathers. Uh, to be able to talk about this. So this is something Gabby has actually done, or Dr. Haynes has done a ton of research on, and is going to be releasing some research papers on that particular mm -hmm. topic. So Gabby, what did you think about this? Uh, it's just hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just very hard to read because the mindset is they're trying, pushing this idea of dinosaurs being related to, di uh, to birds. Mm -hmm. So everything they find in the dinosaur um, they push that, oh, it looks like a, a bird. <clears throat> and many times when they find something and they call a dinosaur, 
but it looks like a bird. It's actually a bird. It's not a dinosaur. So that's a big problem. So they're using here now those new terms because of phylogenetic uh, ideas, uh, non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. Bird is a bird, dinosaur is a dinosaur. Stop with those terms <laughs> because it's just confusing. What yeah. is a non-avian dinosaur? <laughs> All the dinosaurs are non-avian. Yes, they're not you know, birds. Yes, so <laughs> it, it just uh, make a, uh, brings a lot of confusion and the change of the terms and all those things, um, trying to always put the feathers in dinosaurs. Uh, one thing that we have to think is the definition of feather has been changed. The definition of feather, when you think about feather, not like those feathers that we find in modern birds and just birds that we see today, alive today, uh, those are feathers. But in their world view, a filament, only a filament, can be called a feather. So if you find a dinosaur with any structure like a filament, which sometimes it's collagen fibers and those kind of stuff, they already see, see, this is feather. No, this is not feather. You change the definition of feather so it could fit in your evolutionary worldview. And that's a big problem that we have to see. So when you hear anything about like dinosaurs and feathers, just think the definition of what a dinosaur is change, a definition of what a feather is also change. And they're talking here melanosome. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. It's okay. This, this is, is your my area of expertise. Yeah, <laughs> this is my thing. Uh, I have been studying this and I, I just thought it, I just think it's very interesting. I just wish that we could get somebody up here who had some passion about it, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those melanosomes, you know, it's possible, of course, it's possible for melanosomes to be um, um, preserved. But the mm. thing is, some of the analysis that prove that they are melanosomes in most of those papers, they're not done. They're not done. So yeah, it's possible, but please just do what it needs to be done. So we can be 100% sure that what was found that was actually melanosome and not bacteria and not taphonomic distortion right. or any, anything like that. Melanosomes are basically, they have melanin in them. They have the pigments in them, which give the color to right. different organisms today. I mean, we know this. And so, but initially, because they initially thought these were bacteria <laughs> and then they're like, wait a minute. No, I'm, they look like melanosomes after they did some more research. Um, but uh, yeah, they wouldn't expect these things to last mm -hmm. millions of years. And so that's why they're surprised to find them. Right. Because they're not millions of years. But yeah, this is something that they've been, they talked about with Archaeopteryx, I don't know, maybe about a decade ago. They talked about how we know that the, the color here is because of the melanosomes that mm -hmm. would be black. And yet they had pictured it as so colorful and everything else. So a lot of it, I think they said maybe about 95% of it was black um, based on those feathers. But that's not a, that one's not a dinosaur. That one is right. a perching bird. And um, here in the United States, they have, because I'm from Brazil, so uh, here I've, I, I learned something like walk like a duck, talk, talk, talk like, like a, a duck. duck, and what, what and else? Then it is a duck. Then it is a duck. <laughs> so here they see it has feathers, it's like a bird, uh, but it's a dinosaur. It must be a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, and it just, uh, yeah. And so many things that you see here in this paper that when you go back to the original paper that, pu that was published on that genus, or that species, you see that it has nothing to do with what they're actually talking about. So it's based on reconstruction, based on logical fallacy, and then they come up with some conclusion and just start throwing up, uh, throwing out there all these conclusions that has nothing to do with the original paper. And it's, that's an, an important point. A lot of times these original papers are uh, very scientific in terms of here's what we observe and it mm -hmm. may have been this, it might have been that, and that's the language they're using. They're being cautious, but then you get these popularizers, these, the more popular level material where they're taking that information and people are writing in terms of this is fact and this is mm -hmm. exactly how it is and, and they really distort what the original yeah. was talking so about. So we have to be careful when we read some of those, those articles. They might be misleading. Yes. <laughs> She's right. not passionate about this. Not no, at all. Not okay. at all. <laughs> all right. Neanderthals of the North. And so this is um, a study that involved a lot of different types of archaeology. They looked at um, certain dating methods, sedimentology, micromorphology, pollen, all these things to basically ascertain if Neanderthals um, lived in certain regions or not at certain times of the year. And uh, so, as we've said many times before, Neanderthals are fully human. 
Okay, they're not some sort of pre, you know. We've got an exhibit. We've got uh, right here in right the creation here. museum. Right. The starting points exhibit has right. Neanderthals in there as part they're of the human kind. Not a prehistoric mm -hmm. man or anything like that. They're they're fully human. They're smart. They made tools. They had um, jewelry. They had musical instruments. And so um, again, I think that's why when they find some of these things, they're always so shocked from an evolutionary standpoint because they're like, wait a minute, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to be. But yet we see that they buried their dead as another example. So they're mm -hmm. fully human. And basically, this article just says Neanderthals are snowbirds. So. <laughs> When it was warmer, they were further south or further north. When it was cooler, they were further south. Yeah. Wow. So people were intelligent and they did intelligent <laughs> things to that. avoid the, the areas that really, really weren't unlivable. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I don't know why, you know, so people like my, <laughs> my kin went to Wisconsin. I've, I've been in there in the winter. If you've been there, you would know why I'm now south um, up there <laughs> because it's not yeah, that so fun. So people that, for example, near the top, if they lived here in Kentucky, they would go to Florida. Well, they might be able to handle this. This isn't that bad here, but <laughs> it's from me. I'm from Brazil. This is it's freezing. <laughs> it is freezing. I Long think it's pretty it. balmy. <laughs> Anything uh, more than 72, it's 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 less than 72. It's freezing for me. <laughs> But I think, too, um, what I was going to say was they think that Neanderthals, well, we know that Neanderthals lived, they were a population of people. They're not a different species of people, but they were a different a population of people that lived shortly after the flood, probably during the Ice Age. So that was going on in the more northern latitudes. And so it probably, they, some of this was related to the fact that it was just really, really cold in certain areas. And so they probably were trying to live further south at certain, uh, at sometimes just to avoid that extreme cold, maybe when it, during the cooler months of the year. So, mm -hmm. yeah, because they're fully human and, and smart. Intelligent, yeah. Okay. Amid public concern about grooming kids, American Library Association picks president who pushes queering libraries. Okay, so this just is really sad in my opinion because, you know, I remember as a kid going to the library many, many times and getting books and it was fun and it was something to look forward to. And my parents pretty much didn't have to worry about the books that I took off the shelf. But that is just not the case anymore. And the American Library Association, just like the National Education Association, is a very liberal organization that pushes, um, pushes agenda, homosexual agenda, um, like LGBT, CRT, all of those things all the time. Although this, th th this woman that was elected president, she says they don't do that. Right, this person who describes herself as a Marxist lesbian uh, is in interviews will say, no, we don't push this, but then on her Twitter feed and other places, that's all over the place yeah. where she's saying, oh, yeah. this is how we do it, this is how we need to do it. this is what yeah. we need to be all about. Right. And what Dr. Purdom was talking about with the NEA and with the, the Library Association, that, that's been a calculated thing that has been going on for many decades to, mm -hmm. to push an agenda through there to get control of the teachers colleges and push a leftist ideology. We, that's been going on since like the 1930s with Dewey and right. everything. That's where that all started. Uh, but yeah, this, this person is um, very, uh, if I can say two-faced, maybe the right way mm -hmm. to talk about it, where in public when she knows that it's going to be parents who are concerned about things, uh, she'll say one thing and then turn around and talk about this, this term that they use, uh, queering, which means really to distort anything to do with truth and Judeo-Christian worldview. You are rallying against that. Mm -hmm. And anything and everything that contradicts that, you're for. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. And there's a statement in here. I, I, uh, uh, Dr. Purdom, I think you had read that earlier. Yeah, just and there was one, it was, I mean, it's just, sometimes you just shake your head when you read certain things, because she says, uh, she essentially explained queer theory as the rejection of the existence of truth, either in language or in anything. And so this is a quote directly from the, this president. Viewing cataloging and classification from a queer perspective is one that challenges the idea that classification and subject language can ever be corrected once and for all. She argued that since gender identities are fluid, so must be library classification systems and stacks. They're never gonna find a book. I think, how are you ever gonna find a book if that's the case? It's, uh, yeah, you just gotta, gotta laugh at that. Cause you're like, are you serious? Like now even that's, a, a subjective, right? right? There's no objective truth. It's subjective. So apparently it's up to every librarian to do whatever way they want. And basically, good luck ever finding a book because it could change the next day if the librarian decides it needs to it's be It's whatever different. they want as long as they can help kids find books on LGBTQ+. Right. Oh, and yeah. what That's I see, the important thing for what them. What I see here is just like, 
it's a, it's a mind that is so pervert that it's, it's involving those things, even with cataloging books. Right. Goodness. Yeah. You know, like, wh where's the limit of this? There's no limit. Mm -hmm. And that's a, it's, a, it's a really sad thing to see that yeah. now places that, as you, as a yeah. child, would go and everything, it's a place that the parents need to be very careful. Very careful. Very, very careful. Very careful. Yeah, it's interesting. She said there's no big library agenda. <laughs> I'm like, yes, there is. I mean, yeah. we now have drag queen, drag queen story hours. Mm -hmm. um, even where, um, even in very rural areas, okay, because I live in a rural area, the local library has an LGBT group for teens. Okay, so it's everywhere. Um, and this is, and it's just becoming more and more common. So um, just a warning to parents, you know, you're gonna, again, I'm not saying you can't go to the library, but you're gonna have to be very careful when you go to the library. You're gonna have to see what your kids are looking at and what they're picking up. And um, you're gonna have to be a little bit of a helicopter parent, shall we say, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to hover a little because you wanna protect your children. Again, that's, yeah. that's the most important thing. And, and it's not just in the, you know, the regular novels with a lot of words, it's also the, the graphic novels, comic books, that kind of thing. It's all over the place mm -hmm. in those things. So be very careful with it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Parents' lawsuit claims school secretly helped kids adopt new gender identities. And again, it kind of goes along with what the last article is that in schools, many times, what we're seeing, this is about Massachusetts, the state of Mach Massachusetts, but where these children are transitioning, quote unquote, to n different genders, different um, names, and the teachers are not telling the parents. They're keeping it totally, totally secret, totally hidden. Uh, and then the parents find out about it, and of course they're upset. And so right. this is a lawsuit that's being brought by <clears throat> two sets of parents on the same school district where, where their children, quote unquote, transitioned. Yeah, and we have seen a lot of articles. This is not a new one, this mm -hmm. is not the first one. We have right. seen this on and on and on happening where a lot of places like school, they're, they're trying to do that, just, you know, keeping secret from parents and sometimes even like making the kids being against the parents, mm -hmm. you know? And that's a big problem because, you know, like it's your family. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and something it, like that is happening. It goes back to an ideology <laughs> about who is responsible for the children. If you look at people who come at things from more of a socialist Marxist worldview, their idea is that the children belong to the state and therefore yeah. it is the, the school's job to train them to be good citizens rather than good people. They are good citizens of the state and that is the highest priority. And so they don't think parents have the right to uh, train them, uh, train up a child in the way that they should go according to biblical standards because that's not their foundation. So you have to understand that the NEA and some of these other groups, that they are very far down that path and mm -hmm. that's the ideology that's being pushed. They really truly believe that the children belong to them, not to the parents. And yet the Bible tells us that it's the parents' job to train up the children. And uh, so it's... It, there's no neutrality in this. Right. There, there is no middle ground on mm -hmm. that. Either, either God's word is true on this, and it, it is, or this secular ideology is true, mm -hmm. and that's what's being advanced, that's what's being pushed, and we have to be very aware of that in schools. It's so easy for us to just say, you know, I, was, I went to school 30 years ago, it wasn't that bad. It, it was bad, I went 30 years ago, right. and it was bad, but it's gotten a lot yeah, worse. way and worse. You have, to, you have to be aware of that, and it's gonna continue and to it's, go that way. It seems like the speed of getting worse, mm -hmm. it's, Faster, faster, you yeah. know, because I went to school and then the, you said it was, of course, had something here and there that was right. not good. But you look at school system today and it just, it just, yeah, and terrifying. I, I, I would recommend to you, I had a friend who came to me, this same thing happened to her child, okay, where she was in a school district, in a school where she had, was changing her gender, quote unquote, and her name and all of that, and the parents found out about it. And I said, you know, she was asking me what to do. I said, you need to take your child out of that school. You need to right. take them. I, I mean, I know it can be very challenging. I'm not saying that, but your child is, is more important than anything else. Right. And you need to get them out of it because there's just, there's typically no good way to remedy that. Uh, especially because it's not just the teachers too. Right. It's the other students, students yeah. that are pressuring these children many mm -hmm. times into these things as Supporting. well. Supporting. It's a contagion almost right. is how they've described it. And so it's the cool thing to do. Get your child out of there. There's, right? there's a recent book that talks about a lot of these transitioning stories and the people who regret it. And, and they're writing into the author, this woman, who's not even writing from a Christian perspective, but she sees the problem. She sees this, how this is such a trend rather than right. something that's based in um, in genetics or anything else, and it, usually through peer pressure, and she said the one thing that has worked for people 
the, the only thing that has been effective is they have to move. They, uh, they get out of that situation completely so that the child is surrounded by different peers and not having the same sort of pressures and everything. And mm-hmm. so it's heartbreaking that you have young children who are being pressured into these things and, and being taught by teachers that they, that they like and respect that this is a, a cool thing to explore. You should right. try to do this. And, uh, the, you know, the numbers bear that out. When we look at the number of young people who are identifying as LGBTQ, we did a, a, a thing just about a few months ago where 16% of them are, say, are identifying. Sometimes it's even higher than that in certain polls. Yeah. All right, Florida Atheist uses state's new book banning law to object to the Bible. Okay, so basically in the state of Florida now, and I know you've seen a lot of this coming from Governor DeSantis, and he's trying to really get these laws passed and and things done so that things like CRT are not being taught to these children and that especially young children are not being taught these, this very much sexual agenda. And so there's certain books then that these children are not allowed, like parents can object to certain books and um, certain books can't be used in the classroom. So he says, okay, well, if that's the case, then you can't use the Bible either because the Bible has rape and incest and all these horrible things in it. And so therefore it can't be used either. Yeah, so the Bible does have some things that are pretty disturbing because it shows us human nature. It shows us that people are sinful. I mean, if, if you don't think the Bible has some strange thing that read the end of judges it's pretty pretty bad. pretty bad what happened mm-hmm. because people were sinful everybody what was doing what was right in their own eyes this mm-hmm. is what happens when you do that when you abandon god and his word and uh, so the bible's not saying these things are good and the lord was pleased with this it's saying these things were sinful right. and wrong and should not have happened here's the consequences of that mm-hmm. and and we're seeing in our culture the consequences of what happens when you abandon god and his word and the, a lot of times the, the atheist and he does it here where he pulls verses out of context and, and uses them and says that, you know, the, if, if a woman is raped, the father has to pay 50 silver pieces. No, actually the rapist is put to death is what was happening. Mm-hmm. That's what happened in the law. Uh, there's certain, so there, if you read it in context, you'll see what happens. But this is, mm-hmm. this is one of the ways that young people are tricked into rebelling against scripture is they, things are pulled out of context. They're not giving, they're, or they're twisted so they don't even mean at all or say at all what the Bible actually says. And then young people are turned against it because they think, wow, this is just uh, terrible. How could the Bible teach that? Well, look what it says. It doesn't actually teach that. Mm-hmm. Wasn't that what the, the serpent did? <laughs> yeah. Very right? much, yep. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, um, just to finish up here, uh, resource, we highly recommend the gender and marriage war. So this talks a lot about some of these issues that we were discussing today with gender and homosexuality. And, you know, as Christians, we need to be prepared to give an answer um, to those questions and respond to our society and um, to tell them, help them understand what does the Bible say about these issues and the gospel of Jesus Christ, most importantly, that can bring um, light and truth to them and to save them out of their sin. And that's the most important thing. So this is a great resource that we have. Also, um, this year, our VBS, Zoomerang, is focusing on the sanctity of life. And while what a very relevant um, topic to be addressing this year and the year that we hope that Roe v. Wade will be overturned. And so if you want to find out more about that particular VBS, you can go to answersvbs.com uh, for more information. Also, uh, ABC Digital, this is, um, so we have, we, our curriculum is called ABC, Answers Bible Curriculum, and um, it's for ages from all the way from pre-kin- pre-kindergarten all the way up through adult. And we have a digital version of that, okay, called myanswers.com, and you can be able to see all of that Sunday school material there. It makes it really easy to plan it and to give it to maybe substitute teachers or to hand it out to your teachers, whatever it may be, just a great way to be able to have everybody in the church communicating um, and using that curriculum. So you can find out more about that again at myanswers.com slash ABC. So we're out of time for today, so we'll see you back on Wednesday.